Hello, welcome to Club Book with Dan Pippenbring. I'm Andrea Swenson. I'm a music journalist in Minneapolis. Uh, I'm the host of the Official Prince podcast, and I also have a book of my own called Got to Be Something Here, The Rise of the Minneapolis Sound. Super excited to talk to Dan. I have a couple of housekeeping notes and a little bit of an introduction before we bring him out, though. Before I introduce Dan, allow me a moment to tell you about the series that is bringing him to us. Club Book is a program of MELSA, which is the Metropolitan Library Service Agency, made possible through Minnesota's Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and coordinated by Library Strategies, part of the Friends of the St. Paul Public Library. Carver County Library is the co-organizer of this evening's talk. Thanks also to our partnering bookseller, Red Balloon Bookshop. A purchase link to the beautiful ones will be available in the comments section of this live stream feed. You can have it shipped, you can pick it up at their lovely store in St. Paul, or if you're local, they will even deliver it personally to your door. One final housekeeping note, also in the comments tonight, you'll see a survey link. Nelsa would greatly appreciate hearing what you think of this club book program. It's quick and easy. Now for our featured event. It practically goes without saying that Prince was one of the most original, accomplished, and beloved musicians of our time. He was also one of the more enigmatic. In early 2016, he approached Dan Pipe and bring the 29-year-old editor of a literary magazine, The Paris Review, about collaborating on his memoir. Prince envisioned the project as a way to reveal more of himself to his legion of fans. His untimely death that April left Pippenbring with a dilemma, abandon the book project or complete the manuscript in a way that realized Prince's intentions for the memoir. Pippenbring reconceptualized, completed and published The Beautiful Ones two years ago now in 2019. In one of a host of glowing reviews, Variety said of this number one New York Times bestseller, The Beautiful Ones brings so much new information to light that it's hard to imagine anyone being disappointed. Dan Pippenbring is also co-author with Tom O'Neill of Chaos, Charles Manson, the CIA, and the Secret History of the 60s. Dan, welcome. Hello. Thank you for having me, Andrea. Uh, so nice to see you again. Yes, I'm sorry it's not in person. Um, I think it was almost two years ago to the day that you and I talked about this very book on stage at Paisley Park in Chanhassen. And if you had told me then that in two years time, we would basically not be allowed to meet in person because there would be a dangerous virus, I don't think I would have believed you. I probably would have said you were insane. But here we are. Um, this is actually the longest I have, I have been away from Chanhassen since I first went there in 2016. Um, and about a month ago, I saw that it was making a slew of headlines because uh, Money Magazine had named it the best place in America to live, and that brought a huge smile to my face. And I thought it was very fateful that uh, we were doing this event so soon after that. Uh, and of course, that brought a lot of attention to Paisley Park, too, which I like to think is the real reason it's number one. Uh, well, that and the dinner theater. I mean, let's not get ahead of it. Of course. Um, so I thought I would read a little bit from the book. I'll read two short kind of Chanhassen focused parts of my introduction and then a really brief portion of um, Prince's pages and then uh, we can talk about it. I love it, take it away. Okay, thank you. Let's see here. Okay, so I'm gonna start uh, skipping ahead a bit to basically the, the moment I first met Prince and, and arrived in the fateful town of Chanhassen. Oh, sorry, I've already lost it. In a 1996 interview with Oprah, Prince explained why he stayed in Minnesota when most of his peers favored life on the coasts. It's so cold, he said, it keeps the bad people out. Sure enough, there was an entrenched layer of snow on the ground when I landed, and it wasn't just the bad people who were away. Hardly anyone seemed to be around at all. Prince's driver, Kim Pratt, picked me up at the airport in a big black Escalade wearing a plastic diamond the size of a ring pop. Sometimes you gotta fem it up, she said. My meeting at Paisley Park was still hours away. No one seemed to know when exactly. 
So Kim dropped me off at the Country Inn and Suites, an unremarkable chain hotel in Chanhassen that served as a de facto Paisley substation. One of Prince's aides told me that he'd lived there for so many years that he'd apparently broken the recumbent bicycle in the hotel's fitness center. Apparently Prince had paid for enough rooms there to have bought the place four times over. I was on call, quote, until further notice. I felt like I was joining a long and august line of people who'd been made to wait by Prince, people who had sat in rooms in the same hotel, maybe in this very room, quietly freaking out just as I was quietly freaking out. I turned my television on, on. I turned the television off. I had a mint tea. My room looked out onto sun bleached shingles, a pine tree and a disused ladder. Since I knew that photography was strictly verboten at Paisley, I took a picture of this view instead. And if anyone wants to see it, just put a note in the chat, I'll, I'll send it to everyone. Um, around 6.30, Kim texted me to let me know that she was picking me up. P, everyone in the Paisley sphere called him P, I would discover, was ready to see me. The sun had set, so my first glimpse of Paisley came under cover of darkness. From the outside, it's disconcertingly unassuming. It was illuminated by purple sconces when Kim drove up to it, but even so, I would have believed that it was the regional headquarters of a defense contractor or a showroom for co-extruded plastic products. There was almost nothing around it. I had never fully appreciated how isolated it was. I confessed to Kim that I was nervous, that my heart was racing. She laughed it off. You'll be fine, she said as she parked in front of the complex. My right hand was freezing, mindful of the fact that Prince might soon be shaking it. I sat on it to warm it up. He's really sweet, you'll see, Kim said. Actually, it looks like you'll see now, that's him at the door. And so it was, Prince was standing alone at the front door to Paisley Park, ready to introduce himself. Dan, nice to meet you, I'm Prince. His, full, his voice was full of calm and lower than I'd expected. In the foyer, the lights were dim and though preparations for the night's concert were underway, not a hundred feet from us, Judith Hill was playing in a few hours on the Paisley soundstage followed by Morris Day in the time. This part of the complex was empty. The silence was broken only by cooing doves, live ones, in a cage on the second floor. Scented candles flickered from the corners, their sweetness dominated the room. Prince was wearing a loose draped top in a marled sienna with matching pants, a green vest, and a pair of beaded necklaces. His afro was concealed beneath an olive green beanie. The sneakers he favored in his final years, white platforms with light up lucite soles, flashed red as he led me up a short flight of stairs and across a small skyway to a conference room. Are you hungry, he asked. No, I'm okay, I said, though I hadn't eaten since morning. Too bad, Prince said, I'm starving. I winced, we'd exchanged fewer than a dozen words and already we were out of alignment. In the conference room, his trademark glyph was etched into a long glass table. Toward the back, a heart-shaped couch sat beside a fern. On the vaulted ceiling, a mural depicted a purple nebula bordered by piano keys. Prince sat at the head of the table and told me to take the seat next to him, a bit of instruction he always offered. He always offered, I'd later notice. Sit here. He gave the impression of someone who'd grown accustomed to choreographing the space around him. It smells good in here, I said. Yeah, I like candles, Prince said. First things first, had I brought a copy of my personal statement? He wanted to go over it together. I hadn't, but I could read it from my phone if he wanted. I fumbled for it in my pocket, fearing that I was already in over my head. I knew Prince did not suffer phones gladly. Mine had a cracked screen, which I hope would endear me to him. I cleared my throat and began, when I listen to Prince, I feel like I'm breaking the law. Now let me stop you, Prince. Let me stop you right there, Prince said. Why did you write that? It dawned on me that he might have flown me all the way out to Minneapolis just to tell me that I knew nothing of his work. The music I make isn't breaking the law to me, he said. I write in harmony. I've always lived in harmony, like this. He gestured at the room, the candles. He asked if I've heard of the devil's interval or the tritone, a combination of notes that created a brooding, menacing dissonance. It reminded him of Led Zeppelin. Their kind of rock music, bluesy and harsh, broke the rules of harmony. Robert Plant's keening voice, that sounded law-breaking to him as a kid not any of the music that he and his friends made. Prince was serious about this, even grave. I tried to make a joke about how some songs might qualify as misdemeanors while others were capital crimes. He remained stone-faced. Okay, we were off to a frosty start. Behind his sphinx-like features, I could sense his skepticism about me. 
I tried to calm my nerves by making as much eye contact as possible. Though his face was unlined and his skin glowing, his eyes betrayed trace elements of fatigue. It came and went, but it was there, a glassiness, a fleeting restlessness. I kept reading my statement. To my relief, much of it sat better with him than the first lines had. We spoke a lot about diction. Prince had developed fastidious ideas about which words belonged in his orbit and which did not. Certain words don't describe me, he said. There were terms bandied about in the white critical establishment that demonstrated a complete lack of awareness of who he was. Actually, all the books about him were wrong because they embraced these white critical terms, he said. Alchemy was one. When writers ascribed alchemical terms to his music, they were ignoring the literal meaning of the word, the dark art of turning metal into gold. He would never do something like that. His object was harmony. He reserved a special ire for the word magical. I had used some version of it in my statement. Funk is the opposite of magic, he said. Funk is about rules. It was human, the result of work and sweat. There was nothing magical about it. And now I will skip ahead to Prince's pages, just so you can have a taste of them. And these were handwritten and are reproduced in the book in, in his handwriting, which uh, is truly lovely to behold. My mother's eyes. That's the first thing I can remember. You know how you can tell when someone is smiling just by looking in their eyes? That was my mother's eyes. Sometimes she would squint them like she was about to tell you a secret. I found out later my mother had a lot of secrets. My father's piano. That's the first thing I remember hearing. As a younger man, his playing was very busy, but fluid. It was a joyous sound. The eyes and ears of a songwriter can never get enough praise. The way things look and the way things sound when conveyed lyrically can give a song space and gravity. Of course, to this writer, there was nothing more beautiful than his mother's eyes, but why? One of the reasons is how playful they were, the fun and mischief they promised. There were two princes in the house where we lived, the older one with all the responsibilities of heading a household and the younger one, whose only modus operandi was fun. Not just any run of the mill childhood board game fun, but fun with a wink attached. My mother liked to wink at me. I knew what a wink meant before I knew how to spell my name. A wink meant something covert was going on, something special that only those who were in on it could attest to. Sometimes when my father wasn't playing piano, he'd say something to my mother and she would wink at me. She never told me what it meant, and sometimes it would be accompanied by a gentle caress of her hand to my face. But I'm quite sure now this is the birth of my physical imagination. An entire world of secrets and intrigue, puzzles to solve, and good old fashioned make believe, a place where everything for a change goes your way. One could get used to this. Many artists fall down the rabbit holes of their own imaginations and never return. There have been many who decry this as self destruction, but I prefer the term free will. Life is better lived. What path one takes is what sets us apart from the rest. Those considered different are the ones most interesting to us. A vibrant imagination is where the best songs are found. Make-believe characters wearing make-believe clothes all together, creating memories and calling it life. My parents were beautiful. To watch them leave the crib dressed up for a night on the town was one of my favorite things to do. Even though my mother was walking funny when she came home, it was all worth it to me just to see them happy. Whenever they were happy with one another, it was all right in the world. Thinking back, my father's mood used to change instantly whenever my mother was dressed up. She craved attention and he gave her plenty of it when she was sharp. Of all the family, friends and relatives, my parents were the sharpest. No one could accessorize like they could. My mother's jewelry, gloves and hats all had to match. My father's cufflinks, tie pins and rings all sparkled within the sharkskin frame of his suit. My father's suits were immaculate. There were so many of them. Every shirt had a corresponding tie to go with it. My favorite were the arrowhead style that rested just under the collar. Matter of fact, my father always outdressed my mother. Maybe there was a secret contest going on that we weren't aware of. She never gave me the wink on that. And I'll stop there. It's really lovely to listen to you read his writing out loud. It occurs to me I've never really experienced it that way. I haven't listened to the audiobook 
uh, it just kind of hits a little differently when you can hear the words the way they sound out loud. Yeah, yeah. The audiobook version, um, they got a number of different people to read it. Um, and it came out really well. I was so nervous because so much of the book is visual. It's a lot of photographs. But um, actually, since the pandemic, I've had a lot of people write to me and say that they've heard the book in its audio version and that they really enjoyed it, um, which is kind of fitting for a musician, you know? I think it's so telling that music is so deep in him that there's a kind of musicality to those sentences that comes out no matter who is reading them. It's really special. Absolutely, yeah, and I was thinking about how we don't usually first experience any of Prince's words in the written form. Usually we hear them first in a song and there's something natural about hearing them out loud. So thank you for reading to us. <laughs> that was really lovely. My pleasure. Um, I was thinking about the passage about you being at Paisley Park on that day of the Judith Hill and Morris Day show. Um, it's so, mm -hmm. such an interesting time. Well, in his career, it was just a week after he had done the piano and a microphone gala, the big debut of that um, concert format at Paisley Park. And then he had this follow-up weekend with all of his favorite bands coming to Paisley Park to play. It's also a very funny thing for me to revisit personally, because I was actually at Paisley Park while you were. Yeah. We didn't know each other, meet each other, see each other. But yeah. I was off, squirreled away in a corner of the NPG Music Club room in one of the dressing rooms waiting to interview Morris Day. And I ended up waiting for him for two and a half hours. So yeah, I can very much relate to your, um, your writing about sitting in the hotel room, pacing around. <laughs> I remember when we pieced that together, it was kind of amazing uh, just to think of everything that was happening under that one roof at that time and how I think literally the only person who knew everything that was going on would have been Prince. And there was this yeah. kind of hidden choreography uh, to that vastness with all those hallways. I remember thinking for sure that I was going to get lost uh, and that, you know, he would want to find me and I would just be, you know, wandering somewhere alone. So yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's really fun to think about all the moments over the years that must have happened like that, where people were in the same building and they didn't even know it. Yeah, I remember um, the photographer, Jeff Katz, who was Prince's photographer in the kind of mid to late 80s, he said yeah. once that he thought if someone popped the roof off of Paisley Park, it would have looked like Santa's workshop with all these different elves, like oh. <laughs> doing all their different little projects, making the clothes and, you know, doing the business calls and having their meetings and making music videos. And it was just every room, there was something else going on. Yeah, it's, uh, I really wish I could have seen it kind of at the height of its uh, industriousness, I guess, in, in the 90s when it was staffed up and there was that full wardrobe department and, and it had the feeling of, of Santa's workshop. I, guess. I think that would have been well, you know, not magical, but something, something interesting for sure. Yeah. Definitely not magical though. <laughs> no, in no uncertain terms. So something I was thinking about is that, you know, it's been now five years since you were at Paisley Park and talking to Prince and starting to really think about doing this project. And it's been two years since the book came out. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, you know, now that you're not so like steeped in it every day, thinking about it, when you look back on your interactions with him, what are the things that have stayed with you? Great question. Um, I would say first and foremost would, would be his sense of humor and just his ability to kind of penetrate you instantly with a look. I think his eyes really. Uh, and of course he remembered his mother's eyes first and foremost. I think he clearly inherited them and their kind of insane power, which of course comes through even in the very worst photograph of him, but then when you meet him in person, it's on another level. Just, uh, I mean, it seems like he's taking in all of you and, and kind of both revealing and hiding himself all at the same moment. Um, so that kind of gaze I think about a lot uh, and the, the warmth, the kind of unexpected warmth that he could sort of turn on and off with it, um, which is something that you see kind of so rarely in a person. But then also I think during the pandemic, especially in the earlier months of it, when uh, most of us were in various forms of lockdown, um, 
I really came to think about his loneliness a lot. And I think that um, kind of sunk in for me in a, in a way, in a more visceral way than maybe it had even when I was working on the book. Uh, I'd always kind of recognized that there could, that there were times of immense loneliness for him and that I think there was uh, a life of solitude that he had chosen for a way that, that even though it had intensely social periods meant that he was really kind of locked up in himself, but there was something about living through a pandemic that often made me think of what it must have been like, especially in the final months and years of his life, maybe to, to live in a place as vast as Paisley Park with so very few people around. Um, and I think something about that, that loneliness and the, the desire to connect that came with it um, started to register really powerfully with me. Um, and it made me really sad, of course, but also even more grateful to have had that experience. Wow. Yeah, I, I've been thinking a lot about the line um, just around that same time, you know, that you visited him. I, I was, I went to that first piano and a microphone show and he did it, the cover of Joni Mitchell's The Case of You, which he had done throughout his career, but there was something about seeing him alone on stage at Paisley Park singing, I'm a lonely painter living in a box of paints. So it mm. just blew me away then. And then the more I think about it now, it just like, I can't even listen to that song without just being rooted right into that moment and that that experience of watching him. But um, yeah, there is something kind of poignant about um, all of us experiencing that level of isolation and then what we do in that isolation. Some people are able to be extremely creative and other people are not <laughs> yeah. know, just getting through it. Yeah, exactly. There was a, a way in which he was kind of made for it or certainly, you know, there is that kind of monkish aspect to a life of solitude that in some ways encapsulates him perfectly and in some ways it's like the polar opposite of, of who he was as a performer and everything. But yeah, that is such a haunting lyric. I love how much he loved Joni Mitchell um, and her lyrics, especially, I think, there's, there is some kind of wavelength that they share uh, and poignant is a really perfect word for it. They, I, I know that she's told that, that story of seeing him uh, in I think the front row of one of her concerts or something when he was really young. And I think it was his eyes that she remembered more than anything, just these massive eyes kind of soaking it in. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of things we're kind of triangulating here, I think in terms of, of his loneliness and his, his ability to connect even just as a spectator. I mean, yeah. I don't think I've ever left a mark on someone just watching their concert. That, that takes a rare breed. Wow, that guy in the front row, man. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. <laughs> really profound. Yeah. <laughs> um, something else I was thinking about, which I read in the introduction is that, you know, after Prince passed, you're kind of at this fork in the road of, do we continue? this book project and if we do how do we do it in a way that really honors Prince's own vision for it um and I'm just curious you know looking back now like if you could reflect a little bit on that moment of like how did you press forward and how did you kind of set like a north star of this is the way I want to do it so that it feels true to the conversations that we had together yeah it's something uh I mean, that's the most difficult question of all, I think. I, I remember when he died, and I think I wrote about this a little bit, but uh, I, I had possession of those handwritten pages, some of which I just read from and which are really at the heart of the book. And I just didn't know what would ever come of them. I was pretty sure that they would probably never see the light of day or that it would be in so many decades that they would register almost as an artifact more than uh, as the, the work of a contemporary artist, you know? Um, and I'd kind of made my peace with that in maybe the month after he died, uh, when I had to return them to uh, Bremer, who was then managing the estate. And that kind of broke my heart all over again and made me think, ah, these, there's gotta be some way to show these to the world. Um, I had pretty much memorized passages of them by that point. And of course, people would always ask me what was in them, how many there were. Most people seemed disappointed, understandably, at how few of them there were. And everyone seemed to be like, well, 
we really want to read them, but there, there just seemed to be no fitting way to bring them out. Like you couldn't make a little purple pamphlet or something that just would not cut it. And you couldn't put them in like a PDF or something. Um, and it wasn't until we went out to Paisley for the first time, and I think June of 2016, so very soon after he had died, um, my editor and publisher and I, um, and once I saw everything that was there, that was the, the only, the first time I think that I was like, okay, there might actually be a way to do this. Um, because there was to use, I mean, the title of a Prince album, so much chaos and disorder in Paisley at that time, but it was sort of exactly how he had left it. And there was something haunting, but also really revealing and special and kind of energizing about that. Um, of course, it could be very spooky to, to wander through a place like that. So kind of loaded with memories and, and grief at that time. But just the, the number of times we would turn a corner or, or you know, find in a drawer or something, a photograph or a note or just another trace of that handwriting that's really special. Um, uh, that kind of said to me like, okay, that, that there's like a thread to be pulled here. And because we had talked so clearly about how he wanted the book to kind of resonate with people, especially with themes of community and a focus on Minneapolis and a focus on his own kind of search for identity uh, as a kid and as a young adult. It just seemed like there were things that almost called out and, and had a kind of second meaning to them because they were vibrating so much on that, on that frequency. And once we found enough of those, I was like, okay, there is a way to kind of embrace the unfinishedness of this book. It's not ever going to be what it could have been or maybe even should have been, but it can kind of celebrate the fact that it's broken in a way and that there are all these fragments that in a very mysterious but, but kind of tangible way point you toward the same trajectory that his mind was on in those last months. Um, and I really had not looked through it for much of the pandemic until a few weeks ago, kind of starting to prepare for this event. And I was really happy to see that I kind of had to put the puzzle together again myself in a way. And I was like, oh, it does sort of do the thing it, it needs to do. It is like uh, someone compared it to like a broken ceramic where you're kind of having to paste it back together yourself. And that is sort of the feeling you get when you read it. And I think there's something effective and ultimately sort of princely about that, I hope. Um, so that, that was our thinking anyway. But I mean, there's so many posthumous, uh, there's so many problems that come with posthumous publication that I think there's no easy or even necessarily ethical way to, to know that you've done the right thing. Um, I see we have some questions coming in, which is great. Yeah, I invite yeah. you to continue submitting questions. I have one more of my own and then um, I'll start working in some of the questions from the audience as well. Um, sure. So thinking about the actual like writing process for you of writing the foreword, which ends up being, you know, a, a big uh, portion of the book that we get to read. Um, I was thinking about the line from Prince where he, he says it would be dope if towards the end our voices started to blend. Yeah. And I was realizing that um, reading your forward that that's exactly what's happening because you're you're the one that's narrating, you know, this experience that you had, but his voice is so prominent in that portion. You you really took a lot of care to try to quote him, you know, robustly and, and when you couldn't quote him directly, you're paraphrasing him. So we really feel like we're kind of with you in that way. Um, I'm just wondering, you know, like from a writing style standpoint, like how did you decide on the kind of tone and voice of your section that you wrote? Yeah, good question. Um, well, I, I used my very favorite writerly tool, which is procrastination, which I find <laughs> is kind of the secret to unlocking whatever part of your brain you need to disgorge. I don't know if you found this as well in your own writing, but the more you put it off, the more genuine it's going to be when it comes out. Like I, I need, uh, uh, I need to put that kind of pressure on myself to figure out what I have to say. So I tried various iterations of it when it wasn't just about do, 
And they always felt a little false or kind of forced or trite in a way. Um, and the problem actually was that there maybe wasn't enough of me in them and that I wasn't bringing across just how surreal it felt to be in that situation and to hear those things uh, from Prince. Um, and the very comment you just uh, spoke of when he said that he wanted our voices to mix, I think it really did sort of unlock that to me. And I, I had to be like, it's okay if I talk about how I felt about this. It's okay if this ends up being a little mini memoir within a memoir, because as long as I'm not larding it with cliches about like the starry eyed fan experience and being true to what my experience was, I think that's going to help people kind of navigate uh, what Prince was saying and, and the kind of meaning of his his desire to write this book at all. So yeah, that, that and waiting until the very last minute really just did the trick, yeah. Uh, that's very familiar to me. <laughs> um, okay, first question, are there more than 28 pages that Prince submitted for his memoir? Are you holding anything back from us, Dan? <laughs> oh yeah, no, I'm not, I'm not. I very much wish that there were more than those. And, um, I still harbor probably misplaced dreams that there is like a cache of quasi autobiographical or diaristic writing that Prince has done that no one has found. Um, that's kind of like my ultimate fantasy. But uh, we went through Paisley pretty thoroughly. And then of course the estate um, began a more proper inventory of everything that they found and nothing really shook out like that. There were lots of fragments and of course, tons of song lyrics um, for just about everything he ever wrote, released or unreleased. Um, and of course there's plenty, I think that the estate uh, will in time release. Um, and I think there's other kind of visual artifacts that would be of interest to people. Uh, but in terms of the pages that he specifically wrote for this memoir, that is, all there are to my knowledge, um, for better and for worse. Yeah, um, I love this question. Can you please explain the cellular memory part? <laughs> oh yes, yeah. Um, this is something that I've actually gone back and forth on a lot. So in my last conversation with Prince, he asked if I believed in cellular memory, which as near as I can tell, is a kind of more new age spin on an idea that I think is actually gaining a lot of traction or has a lot of basis in science, which would be more inherited trauma, I think. So this idea that if previous generations of your family or your ancestors have gone through some kind of pain or suffering that in some genetic way, it leaves a mark that can be traced however obliquely uh, into your own body. Um, and when he brought that up with me, I, I, I did not believe it. Uh, and I, I'm pretty sure I told him that, but I just didn't think the science was there. Um, around the time the book came out, I remember reading much more about this and seeing that there was actually much better scientific evidence for it than I had thought. Could I tell you what any of that is now? No, I certainly couldn't. But I think, I remember being convinced and feeling like, oh, he, he did it again, you know? He's, he's like pulling one over on me even, even now. Um, because I do think there is a lot of power and truth to that notion. I think it probably can be borne out differently by everyone, but I think that in some way, whatever it is that we're kind of saddled with psychologically uh, has a lot to do with things that go back for many generations. Um, I'm not sure how literally he meant that exactly, but I think it carried a lot of weight for him specifically because of his mother and father and the, the tough lives they had lived and the tough relationship that they had together, that kind of conflict in an almost Freudian or psychoanalytic way was sort of being lived out through him. And I really think that it was the defining conflict of his life in a lot of ways. So yeah. I don't know if that really answered that question at all, but that's that's what I got out of cellular memory. 
Um, someone asked, what was your experience in Melbourne like considering that the bad news Prince had received about um, Denise Matthews Vanity's death while you were there? Yeah, that that is one of the, I think every writer or journalist has this kind of, uh, ah, damn it, I really missed an opportunity there kind of feelings. And with Prince, uh, that was it for me. I had just landed in Australia and had gotten into my hotel room and was kind of jet lagged. And I had been furiously Googling Prince basically every hour of every day since I had first met him or had been up, up for this job. And the one time I hadn't done it was then. And if I had, I would have seen that they had announced that Vanity had died. So when Prince called me and told me that he had gotten some bad news, um, I didn't know what he meant until after we hung up. And I think if I had been able to say, like, I saw that, that Vanity had died, he sounded so vulnerable and just so sad and kind of taken aback in that moment. Um, so different from how he had sounded in our first meeting that I really, I, I wonder to this day what would have happened if I had just known what he was talking about. Um, he may have simply not wanted to share anything about it, but it almost sounded like he was sort of hoping that I had seen it, you know, or that I could guess it, um, but I didn't. So he withdrew pretty immediately. And um, yeah, that, that's one of those moments that, that haunts me. Um, and then of course, to see the way that it ultimately played out in his music that night when he had the piano and a microphone show in Melbourne um, was very powerful. Uh, I think I think there was definitely a kind of display of grief there that makes that one of the most impressive performances of his that I've ever heard to this day. Uh, and the way that he kind of worked in the memory of her into those songs, even using her, her given name, Denise, instead of Vanity, which I, I don't think he had ever really done earlier. Um, it just seemed like he was in this tremendously reflective place that was so much aligned with what he wanted to do with the book that, um, I don't know, there was something there that will always be unresolved. Hmm. Yeah, you could sense he was in a reflective place aside from that, you know, that the, the format of the piano and the microphone show and going into yeah. this kind of storyteller mode and wanting to do the memoir in the first place. It was, yeah, I've, I've spent a lot of time reflecting on that too. Even, you know, the change in his appearance and growing out the Afro again, really reconnecting musically to his early kind of funk rock days coming up in North yeah. Minneapolis with Third Eye Girl. It's just like everything was kind of coming full circle. Yeah, absolutely. And you had the good fortune of being at that very first piano and a microphone show. And I think to see him debut that format must have been uh, really beguiling and really kind of mystifying in a way because it, it did represent such a change for him. And yeah, I think it makes sense absolutely to view it as a kind of to view the, the memoir or the desire to write the memoir as a companion piece to that. Yeah. Um, another question, did Prince ever say anything about Paisley Park, what he thought about it or how he felt about living there? Mm, that's a good question. I'm, I feel like I'm sure he did and, and yet I'm struggling to remember what it was exactly. Um, I know that it was still a place that he took a lot of pride in. Um, and I remember just being so shocked that he was still answering the, the front door of it, you know, kind of all, all by himself. Um, and just seeing him kind of walk around it just really quickly with this total sense of ownership um, was something I'll never forget. I think I wish I could remember exactly what it was, but I know that when we were talking about his, his kind of ideals for a, a Black community of artists um, and the idea that owning your masters should be a sort of cornerstone of that and that it could serve as a kind of locus of wealth to the point where if Black musicians owned all their music, they could then use the money from that to kind of literally build 
new schools, new churches, whatever they wanted. I, I think that Paisley came up in that context as a sort of emblem of, of what that could be like um, in the same way that he sings about it in the song. Uh, there is a kind of utopian vision there. Uh, and I think that sort of aligns with this idea of it as a workshop that we were talking about earlier from Jeff Katz. Um, the idea of kind of living and working and in harmony in this place that you've built, um, I think is really special. But yeah, I, I, I wish I could answer that question more exactly, but that's kind of all I'm getting at the moment. I remember um, Morris Hayes told me recently that Prince had envisioned having all of his bandmates live around Paisley Park. Morris actually lived just down the street off of Gelpin and at one point he was hoping, and I think Larry Graham lived really close to there too. I think at yeah. one point he was like, we could all live together. We could have our own, you know, school and our own, you know, whatever we need. And yeah, his, his mind really went there. Like, let's create like a actual community. That makes total sense to me. That's exactly what he wanted the book to inspire people to do. Um, kind of intentional communities, which harken back to like this really rich and exciting period in the US. Um, and, and he brought up, of course, um, Black Wall Street in Tulsa, which uh, as with so many things that he really cared passionately about has since become fortunately much better known. I think it was the 100th anniversary of the, the um, riots uh, this past year. So there's been a slew of great writing about Black Wall Street and that whole fantastic community that of course was destroyed by racism. Um, and I thought of him a lot as that moment kind of came and went, but I think that's kind of on the same path of, of what he was imagining maybe this idyllic community could be like. Yeah. Um, here's a comment and a question. Thank you for this experience, Dan. I have the book and it's wonderful, so personal. Most of the photos I'd never seen. How mm -hmm. did you slash Prince, um, mm -hmm. if he had any um, selections ahead of, uh, ahead of his passing, decide on which photos to include? And what was it like for you seeing them? Oh, good question. Um, so he did, at when he decided to write a memoir, he actually first, before he chose a co-writer, chose um, an editor. And in true Prince form, he gathered three editors uh, around that very same conference table and had that. He just loves the idea of a battle of the bands. And this was like the literary equivalent of a battle of the bands. Like you got your three editors, they're all around the same table and no one really knows it, but they're, you know, they're competing for the, the privilege. And at that meeting, where I really wish I could have been, um, he did bring out a bunch of photos. Um, and to the best of my knowledge, all of them did end up making it into the book, with one exception, which was the original cover art for 1999. There's a Polaroid of it in the book, but what he brought that day was apparently a much bigger kind of cardboard, it was a really big collage that they had, I think he and the band had maybe made in, together in some capacity. And after that meeting, it went missing. And I, I think to this day has maybe not been found unless it's happened in the past few years um, because I really wanted to have more of that in the book. But fortunately, someone had taken a Polaroid of it at some point and that's in there instead. So the, that and a lot of the childhood photos that you see in the early pages especially were things that he brought out at that meeting and wanted to have in the book. Um, and the others, uh, a lot of the, the kind of most vital ones, I think, were in the vault, uh, very carefully tucked away in this one filing cabinet. And when my editor and publisher and I saw those, we just knew right away that they kind of encapsulated everything that he had wanted the book to be about, especially in terms of uh, connecting with his mother and father and his family and depicting the North Minneapolis community. Um, so that was our, our kind of guiding light in a way. And we also decided pretty early on that we didn't want to, if possible, go outside of the bounds of what he had kept. Um, there were a lot of great kind of unpublished or not very well known photos that other people had but we knew that we just wanted to 
to kind of draw a boundary around things that he had kept that had through all of the various phases of his career and um, various changes of address and everything that had stayed with him in some way. Um, so that really helped us kind of narrow it down as well. That makes sense with the memoir that it would feel, and it does feel very intimate looking through, especially the pages where there's like literally a scrapbook that we're looking at with his little handwritten notes about each picture and little jokes he's making about his friends and the pictures. It, it feels very intimate. Yeah, yeah, that seems like, uh, that makes me think of a battle of the bands too, in a way, this kind of like a little cocky, competitive, but above all, just like joyous entry into the world of professional music um, and the discovery of who he was going to be as a performer and his identity and, and the conjuring of the mystery that would come with that. Uh, I think it's all just in that kind of innocent, but, but really wondrous scrapbook. Yeah. Um, somewhat related to the above question, have all the random items that were found, the bits of writing, the photos been kept in some kind of archive? Yes, yeah, to the, to the best of my knowledge, they're all very carefully maintained by the, um, the, the estate hired a professional archiving service, I think Iron Mountain it's called, and this is like what they do. They keep things in a very stable environment and they make sure that they're all good. Um, and I think everything, not just the, the paper items, but everything um, from instruments to recordings and all of that is, is now inventoried and kind of part of that system. Uh, and that was happening in real time as I was working on the book. We really wanted to have it out in 2019 and the estate was kind of frantically discovering literally day by day what they had and they would archive these things and, and give them all barcode numbers and everything. So every morning I would wake up and I would check and there would be, you know, new photographs that they were like, hey, we found this. Maybe you want it for the book. Um, and that was very exciting. Wow. What a process. Yeah, it was, it was pretty crazy. Um. This was one of the pre-submitted questions, but it's so good. I have to weave it in here. If you yeah. could go back and ask Prince one new question right now, and I know we already touched a little bit on the vanity thing, so maybe something that's not yeah. that, what would you ask Prince? <laughs> uh, I mean, I would just want to know more about how he, how, if he were still with us, I would want to know how he felt about this moment that we're living through. I, I would want to talk to him about current events, I think, before all else, he had such a unique mind in that way. And I think he was synthesizing information from all kinds of sources and his own intuition was so strong. Um, and you see that with the record they released over the summer, which ends up being very prescient in any number of ways. And I just know that, uh, I mean, I've heard people say that they're, that they're almost glad that he didn't have to, to live through the George Floyd uh, the death of George Floyd, but I, I think there's something that he would have brought to that moment and, and to our pandemic lives now and to all the chaos that no one else could bring. And I, I just think he would have perspective on it that would that would just be really helpful and, and nourishing in a way, uh, or at the very least would change the way everyone thinks about it. Um, so yeah, yeah. That's what I would wanna know just how he feels about 2021. I've thought about that a lot, you know, being in Minneapolis and um, experiencing the last almost two years now of um, all kinds of events, but specifically the death of George Floyd and, and the uprising. And I thought about how it mirrored his own experiences as a, as a child, you know, with the unrest in North Minneapolis and, yeah. and what he, he would have what he thought about that and then how it would have related to his experiencing it now. And um, there's so many things that I wish he had gotten just like slightly further into his writings about even just like a couple of years so we could get a few more of those details. I know when at our first meeting, he said that he wanted to write a lot of books and if he could kind of tap into that prolific energy the same way he did with music, I really think he could have had a small library of them. Um, and his prose style is just so elegant 
He's very easy to read, even with all the kind of twos and us and and his his princisms. Um, it's just really a treat to see him in that medium, to to encounter him in that medium. And yeah, I think politically, religiously, culturally, he could have. He, he would, the only thing I know for certain is that I have no idea what he would have said and it would have been amazing. Yeah. Did Prince tell you why he chose you? Because there were, there was a process of elimination, I remember in your writing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he never did. He never said, this is why I chose you. Or even that he had chosen me, you know, I mean. <laughs> That's, that's kind of a hallmark of working with him from what I gather, you know, you just sort of, you know, you keep showing up. And when he announced the memoir at an event and, you know, uh, introduced me and said that I'd be working with him on it, I, I was just over the moon um, because that was the first time he'd really said it uh, like that, was to announce it. Um, and he said a number of, you know, very kind things to me, but I think, there was also a part of him that that chose me in part because of how confusing it was because of the I, I think the only reaction you have you, you can have is like oh, what that's cool and all but why and I think getting people to scratch their heads and just kind of almost trolling in a, in a low-key way um he would have this wry smile you know because he would be like people are going to wonder he even said, people are going to wonder why it's you. And I think the fact that people were going to wonder brought him a lot of kind of giddy, mischievous glee. Um, and me too. I mean, it's still, in a way, it's a, it's a joke that he has perpetrated that kind of lives on now through the publication of this book. It's like, wh where did this come from? Why? How? Um, and I think there's something about his his driest, most winking sense of humor that is really explained in that one choice. Hmm. I think there's also the element of that, you know, like he's told uh, Arsenio Hall when he did that special, he was so energized by being around all these young musicians. I think he really kept an eye out for like the, emer always the emerging, what's next, who's like the cool new young person yeah, that is interesting. And like, let's go find out about them and see if it's cool to work with them. I, I feel like there's like a thread of that too in, in your relationship with him. Absolutely. Yeah. He told me that he really liked working with young people and young energy. And I think he was so wary of what he would call the king making of, of major record labels and other kind of powerful media groups that he was like, if I can use my clout to just help elevate people, I'm gonna do that. And, and of course he did that in so many ways, especially in that last decade of his life. Um, everything from programmers to artists to you know various philanthropic groups, uh, like there's just no end to it. Yeah, um, I love this question. So um, they say, I'm intrigued by Prince trying to reconcile the two aspects of his personality as personified by his parents. Can you talk yeah. more about that? Yes, uh, that was something that really was central to his idea for the book, that it would sort of start, as you can see in the pages that he did write on his parents uh, and would sort of telescope out from there to encompass ideas of community and uh, ownership of artistry and all of that. But the center of it for him was his mother and father, and he wanted to break down When Doves Cry uh, lyric by lyric. I think that is a deeply autobiographical song. Um, and his mother, I think for him, as you could hear in the, the passage I read, did represent this mischief and the, you know, the kind of winking side that I was just talking about. And his father was very much the disciplined, maybe the, the lonelier side of him who was working on music and trying to pay the bills um, and trying to do right by God. Um, and I think those two poles were kind of tugging on him for his whole childhood and then his whole adult life too. Um, 
he would say that, you know, he, he enjoyed working on music alone and, and being really disciplined like that. Um, but then if he was out and a DJ put on a song that was really funky, he was going to have to dance. Um, and I think in ways large and small, he just always, well after his parents had died, could see himself kind of behaving as they would in various ways. And I think it was that kind of yin and yang that made him able to achieve at such a great level. But there was also, of course, a lot of discomfort that comes with that, a lot of concern, a lot of questioning about who you really are or how you can kind of find peace if the two people that you're modeled on uh, ended up loathing each other and had to separate. Um, and of course, his witnessing that separation in extremely intimate and personal terms, I think made him always aware that, that there was that conflict, that it wasn't just like he was two people put together. He was two people who didn't belong together who got put together. Um, and I think that ended up being the wellspring of his creativity, but also that it, it kind of um, haunted him a bit. Hmm. Um, another question, did Prince ever talk to you about his spiritual life? That is a good question. It would come up kind of obliquely. He would mention certain parts of the Bible a lot. I think I've taken notes on these, um, but I can't remember what they were off the top of my head. And they would often have to do with uh, numerology or the location of certain artifacts or certain religious sites in the Middle East. A lot of this would come up when he was talking about uh, the idea of black ownership, again, that he felt like going back to ancient times, there was evidence of this in the Bible um, that had kind of been misconstrued by the popular reading of it and that needed to be, I guess, um, kind of reappropriated by, by, uh, by black writers and black thinkers. Um, and it did, it struck me that he was still deeply spiritual, but in terms of some of the stories you hear from maybe the earlier 2000s where he was really inviting people to uh, participate in, you know, full on religious services with them and stuff, that, that never really happened. Um, and he never really asked me about my own religious background. Um, yeah, it, it seemed like there was a lot to unpack there, but he was almost holding back on it in a way. I think that was hmm. kind of something that we would have gotten to later. Um, and some of that's on me too, because I would never really ask many follow-up questions about those biblical passages. I, I much more was interested in hearing uh, about his own perspective on his own life or you know, things like that. Um, I was sort of leery of, of wandering too far into the spiritual before I felt like the book had been grounded in the facts of his own life. Um, and because those pages that he had written were so focused on those and actually deal kind of cheekily with religion, um, we ended up staying much more in the kind of Minneapolis of the 70s than the, the kind of life of the mind and spirituality that we could have gotten into. Hmm. Um, oh my gosh, it's already almost eight o'clock. So um, there's oh, a, okay. one more question that I have not read. So may, we'll make this our last question and then we'll bid you adieu. Um, okay. So this person asked, Prince was such a private person. Do you think that there would have been a lot that he would not share? That's a great question. I do, I do think there would have been a lot that he didn't share. Um, I think he was such a shrewd kind of showman that he was always going to, he was always going to show you kind of one part of himself. Um, I think he was ready to open up more. And I think things like a piano, the piano and a microphone shows prove that. Um, but I do think there was a very guarded, compartmentalized part of himself, and it would have been tough to to get him to to drop the walls. You know, I 
another thing that I of course wish we would have found the time to talk about would be uh, the death of his own child, you know, or, or uh, everything that happens with his marriage to Maite, um, which clearly was a wrenching and defining experience for him and something that he very rarely would speak of. Um, and I do wonder, would he have wanted to go there or would he have shut that down? Um, I think there would have been areas where it certainly would have been tough. And I think maybe that would have been something that he would just would have, would have put off maybe, but um, yeah, I, I, do, I do wonder how, how it would have gone in the kind of later periods if there were things that he really needed to say for the sake of the book and kind of didn't want to say. Right. There's so much I could add and <laughs> ask you about there, but I, I think we have to wrap up. Um, maybe yeah. we can the continue chatting later. Curious <laughs> note uh, to end on. Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And thank you for all that you've done to preserve Prince's memory and, and his legacy and all the things that he shared with you. Um, your work is just, it's so clearly done with so much respect and love for him. So um, I just think that's just an important thing to acknowledge and, and thank you for. Thank you, thank you. That means a lot coming from you too, because I know that you've been so closely involved with everything around him and that you have, I mean, as much a claim to his memory as, as anyone, I think, and have been a very wonderful custodian of it as well. So it's always really fun to talk to you. And I always feel like we're kind of just getting started when it's over, so. I know, me too. Well, I hope to run around New York with you again someday when we can be free and out in the world. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and I hope to run around Chanhassen with you or anywhere in the, yeah. the Twin Cities area, which I really do miss. It's been too long, so. Well, next time you're here, we'll go to Bunkers and we'll do the whole thing. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> That'll be really fun. Okay, thank you so much. Great. Yeah, thank you. Um, please join me in the comments thanking Dan, and I have just a little bit of a outro for you. Um, so this has been a virtual presentation of Club Book, a long running literary series of MELSA made possible by the Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Special thanks again to Carver County Library for the part they played in bringing Dan to us. Before you log off, look for Club Book's survey link, which is in the comments and will be projected in place of my video momentarily. Last, consider joining Club Book next Monday for a talk with nationally renowned columnist and speaker Tamara Winfrey Harris. Her latest book is an essay anthology titled The Sisters Are All Right, Changing the Broken Narrative of Black Women in America. This one will be co-hosted by St. Paul Public Library. And as always, it's free. They'll be right here on Facebook Live. Thanks, everyone. Have a great night. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>